Good evening, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed the sunshine this last week, and it looks like we'll have more through the week. So it should be a delightful and abnormal time for the month of November. I'd like to start this evening's Bible study with a rather direct question. Do you like reading the Psalms? Now your answer to that question is probably uh, going to tell us how your brain is wired. I don't naturally uh, gravitate to the Psalms. I like how-to books, I like <clears throat> biographies, and I like histories. If you like Walt Whitman or Ralph Waldo Emerson or Emily Dickinson or Robert Frost, you probably enjoy also reading the Psalms because like the authors I've just mentioned, the Psalms is a book of poetry. Psalms as a book of poetry was also, in a sense of speaking, Israel or Judah's, more correctly, a hymnal, because it was from the Psalms that many of the hymns were taken. It helps to view the book of Psalms the same way that you view poetry, uh, or lyrics for that matter. Either one works, so if you view the Psalms as if you're reading poetry, or if you view the Psalms as if you're listening to the lyrics of a song, you'll probably enjoy the Psalms much more. In fact, if you go no further than what I've just mentioned, to view the book as a book of poetry or a book of musical lyric, uh, you'll find out that you have already made it far easier to read the book of Psalms if, if you're not already inclined that way. But there's much more to it, uh, and that has to do with content and design. So for those of you who are like me, that you don't intuitively gravitate to the book of Psalms, uh, you may be like I am, I enjoy books like James and Proverbs or the uh, Chronicles or Kings, the narratives and the histories. But if you find that reading the Psalms is a little more challenging, then let's go a little further and look at the issue of content and design, because the more you understand psalms, the more you can appreciate the way they're written. The psalms are, are poems or lyrics that fall into design groups, and those design groups fall into three categories. So if you look at the book of Psalms, and you read through them, the, the majority of the Psalms will fall into one of three categories. And those categories are laments, songs of thanksgiving, and hymns. I'm not sure how uh, everyone sees a hymnal, but I at times in, in singing hymns will see a hymn and think there's a lot of gloom and doom in that hymn a lot of woe is me, a lot of deliver me, a lot of my enemies are doing this and my enemies are doing that. And you wonder, how does that fit into songs and lyrics? So let's take a look. As I said, there are three basic forms that psalms take, and they are laments, songs of thanksgiving, and hymns. Let's take laments first. In times of either individual or national trouble, Judah or Israel, I'll use them interchangeably, I think we all know that Israel uh, abandoned the, the uh, temple and its ceremonies very early in its national existence, and so Judah basically carried it forward. But I'll use the terms Israel and Judah interchangeably, and you will understand uh, the, the reason. Uh, in times of individual or national trouble, psalms of lament were written, and those laments follow a set pattern. Now, scholars have identified uh, approximately 50 different psalms of lamentation, and have seen that they fall into three subcategories. And so as they read through the book of Psalms, the longest book in the Bible, 
they have found that out of those, about 50 of them are psalms of lament. Now, some of them are individual laments. Uh, David, being the primary psalmist, of course, would be responsible for more of them than anyone else. There are times where they're communal laments, and so it's a larger body of people who are expressing their lament. And then there's the penitential lament. Big word, but it just just simply means uh, the lament of someone who is sorry for what he's done and is repenting. I think all of us would relate to the 51st Psalm, which is David's request and his plea to God for forgiveness after his encounter with Nathan and his sin with, with uh, Bathsheba and the killing of Uriah the Hittite. The 51st Psalm is a penitential lament. I'm lamenting, God, what I have done in my relationship with you, and I wish that to change. So individual laments, communal laments, and penitential or laments of repentance. The Psalm of Lamentation usually follows, as I said, a set structure. So let's take one apart. Uh, if you would, turn with me to the third psalm, and we'll pick easy ones. Uh, there are some very lengthy psalms that fall under these categories, but for the sake of, of teaching and for the sake of seeing the illustration, let's, let's try to stay with short psalms that compact the lesson into a, a relatively small amount of space. So we're going to look at the the third psalm, and before we start, let me tell you the component parts that you, you will see in this type of psalm. There is usually an introduction, and that introduction is usually a, a cry to God, a plea to God. Then there's the lament, uh, the, the sadness, the sorrow, the misery, the fear, that the author of the psalm is experiencing. After expressing that, the author of the psalm, then after expressing why I'm lamenting, will confess a trust in God. And after expressing his trust in God, he will then make a petition to God and make a request. And then he'll finish with a declaration or a vow to praise God from that point forward. So an introduction, a lament, a statement or a confession of trust in God, and then a request, a petition, and then concluding with a declaration or a vow to praise God. So let's look at the third psalm. I'll, I'll read it through first of all without stopping, and then we'll come back and take it apart. So the third psalm is only eight verses long, and it reads as follows. Lord, how have they increased who trouble me? Many are they who rise up against, many, against me. Many are they who say to me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me, and I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone, you have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. All right, let's go back through that psalm and then look at the five elements. Introduction, lament, confession of trust, petition, and a declaration or a vow to praise God. The introduction is simply the first verse. Lord, 
How have they increased who trouble me? Many are they who rise against me. And so the author of the psalm introduces the issue. The lament, there is a merging literally within verse 1, almost like the shifting of gears and the putting into the clutch. It all takes place in the first verse. The, the lament begins with the end of verse 1, and it includes verse 2. Many are they who rise up against many, against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. So that's the lament. There are many who, who have risen up against me, and there are many who say to me, God isn't going to help you. He's not going to save you from us. Then comes a confession of trust. Here's what I'm facing, God. Here's what I'm dealing with. But my trust is in you. And the trust statement spans verses 3 through 6. A, tell, a telltale sign is verse 3 begins with but. So we have a transition. But you, O Lord, are a shield to me my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. This is his confession of trust. I cried out to you, I could trust you. I went to bed and I slept soundly, understanding it didn't matter if there were 10,000 who were against me. My trust was in God that he would deliver me. This was his statement of trust. But then there comes a request, and the request is verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. The petition. And then last of all, a declaration or a vow of praise. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. And so this was a declaration. The declaration is, when it comes to deliverance, when it comes to someone that will lift you up out of the worst of your problems and dilemmas, being delivered, saved, i.e. salvation, belongs to the Lord, and your blessing is upon your people. And so this is a, this is a classic lament. Uh, The structure of the Lament Psalm is not unique to the people who spoke Hebrew. Uh, this particular structure can be seen in other societies of that day and that time. It was, so to speak, a common form of expression at the time, uh, not that much different than structures that we are familiar with today also. Uh, anyone who reads poetry or anyone who enjoys poetry and, and just stops a minute and says, all right, let, let me look at the structure of the poem before me. I think we're all so comfortable with the way poems are structured, we don't automatically stop and look. We know they rhyme. So the, the rhyming ends of poems, that's something we, we take for granted. I have at home a book that I pulled off the shelf before Bible study this evening. Uh, an, an author that writes very simple poems that are, are meant to be read by people who are not that deep into poetry. And as I thumbed through his book, I found it fascinating that I think he was entertaining himself by using a, a, a wide range of structures. If you study poetry, there are th two-line poems and, and when you look at a poem in writing, there will be a block, and then a space, and then a block, and then a space, and then a block, and a space. And those blocks can be 
two lines long, three lines long, four lines long, uh, six lines long, eight lines long, ten lines long. And as I was thumbing through his book on poetry, he had every variety. He had the, he had the two liners, the three liners, the four, the six, the eight, and the ten. Uh, usually, usually every word at the end of the line rhymes. Sometimes the structure of a poem and, and our uh, poems are first line rhymes with the third line, the second line rhymes with the fourth line. Now those are structures we're familiar with. What I was saying was the lament was a structure that was not unique to Israel and not unique to the people who spoke Hebrew. And so in that world at that time, uh, a, a, a psalm or a poem or a song, a lyric of lamentation would have been understood by many different cultures. The notable thing about the lament psalm is that those who created and used them believed that God was present and that he was ready to help. They were confident in God and expressed an intimate relationship with him. So as you read through the Psalms, as I said, our, our intent this evening is, is coming to the place where we can appreciate the Psalms more, especially for those who are not inclined toward poetry by nature. And as I said, I, I'm one of those. So having an understanding of the structure helps one appreciate what is being done and what is being said. The second form of psalm is the psalm of thanksgiving. I would expect that in most churches, uh, authorized church hymnals, there will be literal psalms of thanksgiving. And in our American culture, the annual holy day of thanksgiving has been so much a part of our, uh, our nation over the last century or more that uh, psalms of thanksgiving or hymns of thanksgiving are embedded in the hymnals, I'm sure, of most denominations. And it would be true of the Church of God also. Uh, this is a second recognizable, distinct type of psalm. And again, there are multiple forms. And so just as the lament psalm had an individual, a communal, and a, 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 a lament of repentance. So thanksgiving psalms also have more than one form. There are two. There is the individual, where one individual is simply talking to God and expressing to him how thankful he is for what God has done for him. And then there is the communal, where an entire body of people, like a congregation, can all sing together a commonly shared and commonly felt voice of thanksgiving to God. And so thanksgiving psalms take both a communal and an individual form. Like the psalm of uh, lament, the thanksgiving psalm also has its structural parts. There is, to begin with, a proclamation to praise God. So right up front, is is a proclamation the the intent the intent of this song or this poem is to praise god and then there's a summary statement there is usually a report of deliverance and then there is a renewed vow of praise so in the proclamation, the worshiper states his intent to give thanks. And then there's a summary. And then in the third uh, uh, piece of its structure, the report of deliverance, it usually describes some type of deliverance that that person or that body has experienced from a problem or a distress that they have experienced. And then it ends with a renewed vow of praise, and it frequently contains a, a statement or a promise 
either explicit or implied, to give praise to God, uh, not just this once, but to continue doing it from that point forward. So let's take a classic psalm of thanksgiving and dissect it and see the component parts as they play out. In this particular case, let's go to Psalm 30. Now before we begin, let me restate those pieces because we're going to do with Psalm 30 the same that we did with the third Psalm. We'll read it all the way through. Psalm 30 is just slightly longer. I think the third Psalm was eight verses long and Psalm 30 is 12 verses long. But let me restate the component parts and, and see if your eye and ear catch pieces as we go through it. So it, it will start with a proclamation to praise God. There's going to be a summary in there that follows. There's going to be a report of deliverance, how that person has experienced God stepping in on their behalf, and then a, a renewed uh, vow of praise. Okay, let's read, verse, let's read the 30th Psalm. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried out to you, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will, I declare, will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you, I will give thanks to you forever. All right, a little bit longer, so a little more complex, but let's take the pieces apart and look at them. Proclamation to praise, summary, report of deliverance, and a renewed vow. Quite often the proclamations are short. Uh, there are no hard and fast rules, so I'm saying usually, but we will see, I think, in the next category, one that, that, that breaks that usual rule. Here the uh, proclamation is one verse long. The proclamation is, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. That's the proclamation. Here's what you have done for me. Then there's a summary statement. Uh, when you make a proclamation of gratitude, there's a backstory. Uh, oh, why? What happened? What's going on? Uh, that's the summary statement. And that runs from verses 2 through 7. So here's the summary of, of, of why I'm saying, I will extol you, O Lord, for you've lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. So the summary starts in verse 2, O Lord my God, I cried out to you and you've healed me. 
O Lord, you have brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. So here's somebody who was afraid they were going to die, and they didn't. And he is first of all saying, this is, this is how close I came. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you've made my mountain stand strong. You have hid your face, and I was troubled. Summary statement. Now there's a need for deliverance. And deliverance in this particular case begins in verse 8. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. And so he had, earlier, he had earlier implied how close he came to death, and he said, what good am I to you dead? Uh, in the grave, I can't praise you. And so here we are in his report on deliverance. He says, Lord, be my favor, going back and getting a running start. In verse 7, Lord, by your favor, you've made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. And so here is the report on deliverance. He continues on, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned me, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. So this is the full, this is the full report on deliverance. What you've done well for me, how close I came and had to ponder if I was even going to live, how you delivered me and how it is now that I can sing praises to you. The renewed vow is just the last half of verse 12. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So, as I said earlier, the, the uh, proclamations at the beginning and the statements at the end can be very, very short. Uh, they, they don't have to be elaborate. In this particular case, the, renew, the renewed vow of praise in this psalm of thanksgiving is very, very short. And really, what more do you need to say? Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Uh, short to the point, you really don't have to say that much more. So this is a second class of psalm. And uh, I, I'm not giving this to you so that you can write them down. I'm giving this to you only so you can see how many there are. Uh, in terms of psalms of, uh, uh, psalms of thanksgiving of the communal form, the 75th, the 107th, the 124th, and the 129th are all communal psalms of thanksgiving. Individual psalms of thanksgiving are 18, 30, 32, 34, 40, 41, 106, 116, 138. And, and these are not intended to be complete lists, but just to show you how many psalms there are that focus on one simple element, and that is my intent is to thank you. I want to tell you what my problem was. Uh, I want to summarize what all I've been going through. I want to let you know how well I understand how you've 
pulled me up out of this and you've delivered me, then I also want you to know that I'm going to be permanently thankful to you for the rest of my life. So beautiful, beautiful Psalms. And I would fully expect as the uh, Thanksgiving holiday comes up that this would be a time where these would be most relevant. Uh, you find it interesting, I think, if you simply Googled the topic uh, Psalms of Thanksgiving, you would find, uh, you would find uh, a surprising number of sites that are filled with Psalms of Thanksgiving and illustrations of what they are. They're not always technically structured like this Bible study. They may simply pick a piece out of a psalm, but uh, many of them, uh, I think, are seasonal. They're intended to give people something to consider and ponder as we approach the Thanksgiving holiday coming up shortly. The third of the categories, as I said at the beginning, an appreciation of the Psalms can be uh, enhanced by simply knowing that they do have a formal structure and they have a formal design. And if you can read them with that design in mind and with an understanding of that design, then the, the Psalm is more than just a, a poem from an ancient society. The third, the third category is by far the largest. It's the hymn of praise. And these psalms are more general in nature. Uh, laments are obviously focused. I have a problem, or we have a problem, or I am a problem. <laughs> when it comes to a lamentation, you're either lamenting, I have a problem. Or if there's a group of you, we have a problem. And uh, I, I mentioned the 51st Psalm was a psalm, a penitential psalm, where David was saying to God in the 51st Psalm, God, I am a problem. Uh, I have sinned against you. I have, I have, I have done wrong, and, and, and there's, you know, there is no excuse. So I am a problem, and I, I need your deliverance. And then, of course, the, uh, the psalms of thanksgiving are those joyful ones where God has delivered you from something and you are profoundly grateful for the experience and you want him to know you'll never forget it. I think most of us in life, I've had conversations at times with friends or conversations after church as people are talking, and people can share those times that they know that God intervened in their life in such a special way that it wasn't just time and chance, it wasn't just circumstance, it was something that was literally God's intervention to help, to preserve, to save, or to deliver. And you never forget those. You never forget those. And so they bring, they bring about a conviction that I, I need to never stop thanking God for how he has cared for me and delivered me from things that were beyond my ability. As I said, this third category is broader. It's more general. The, the largest number of psalms in the, in the book of Psalms are of this category, the, the hymn of praise. These psalms uh, magnify, and this is, this is their intent. Their intent is to magnify the name of God. And they are psalms that are intended to boast about his greatness. I reflect upon some of the great, uh, some of the greatest writers of hymns in the uh, in the last two or three centuries in the Christian world, and some of them, though they were not from the Book of Psalms, some of them wrote hymns that had no other purpose than simply to magnify the name of God and to boast about his greatness. There are hymns by Isaac Watts that every time I sing one of them, I, I am profoundly impressed that the entirety of a hymn that he may have written was for no other purpose than to magnify who God is, how great he is, how wonderful and marvelous he is. 
Within the book of Psalms, there are other others that praise God for his attributes and his acts. So in this, in this broader category of hymns of praise, some of them magnify God's name. Some of them boast about his greatness. Some of them are more focused, and they'll focus on praising God for an attribute or for a specific act. Uh, it's not in the it's not in the book of Psalms, but to walk outside of the book of Psalms to give a profound example of a hymn of praise when Israel reached the eastern bank of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was destroyed in the sea. Miriam led in both song and dance a hymn of praise, praising God for an act, how he had delivered Israel and how he destroy, destroyed Egypt and how he had freed them from that point onward. So walking outside of the book of Psalms for a moment, this, this is a uh, classic example of a hymn of praise located elsewhere than the book of Psalms. Now, for a, for a hymn of praise, again, as I said, this Bible study is to help you see by means of structure how in reading through a psalm, there's, there's much more to it than meets the eye by simply looking at the statements. The structure augments and uh, elevates the appreciation for what is being done. In the hymn of praise, there is an introductory summons. There is then a main section, and then there's a summary summons. Now, by summons, it is uh, we're, we're, we're summoning you to praise God. So <laughs> that's what is meant by an intro, introductory summons. We are, we are calling you together to, to praise God. And at the end is a summary summons, and that is to remind them of the need to not just stop here, but to continue on. All right, let's uh, let's take a uh, let's take one of the shortest psalms in the uh, in the book of Psalms. This is the one hundred and seventeenth. I haven't done one of those. Uh, nerdy technical studies of longest and sh shortest. Uh, I know the longest, but I haven't done it on the shortest. But I can't imagine uh, in the whole of the book of Psalms that uh, there's anything shorter than the 117th, since it's only two verses long. Very easy to read. O oh, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples, for his mercy, kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Short, sweet, to the point, but it has all three component parts. Uh, the introduction. O oh, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. So here's the introductory summons. You're not an Israelite. You're not a Jew. You're from whoever else, Moab, Ammon, Syria, Egypt, uh, Philistia, wherever. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. We see little, little instances here and there of the awe of the Gentiles toward God. A classic example is uh, Cyrus, the Persian emperor, who found that he had been prophesied to free Israel. And uh, this was a case where he could praise God. If you want to see a case of a Gentile praising God, go back to the book of Daniel and read Nebuchadnezzar's words after God had restored his sanity. And you will see a profound example of a Gentile 
praising the Lord. So here in the psalm, the introductory summon is, I'm calling all the Gentiles to praise the Lord, and I'm calling everybody to laud him, which is just another way of saying praise. Laud and praise are synonyms. Uh, the main section is the first half of verse 2. For his mercy, kindness is great toward us. That's the statement of what it is that we're happy about. His mercy and his kindness, it is just casual. It isn't just hit and miss. His mercy, one element, and his kindness, it is great toward us. It's a sadness to me to watch the annual holiday of Thanksgiving uh, become less and less a focus in American culture. In fact, it's to the place anymore where if somebody actually on media mentions it in more than just a bypassing comment that it's uh, on the calendar and it's going to be here at such and such a time, it actually catches your attention. Uh, we're not a thankful people anymore. We don't park and spend time there. We don't ponder and meditate. We don't we don't share these things as as a country, and it's it's sad to watch. Uh, it seems anymore we go from Halloween to Christmas, and uh, uh, Thanksgiving is uh, a football game day, and gone before you know it. Here, the main section, as I said, is simply the first half of verse two. His mercy. Kindness is great towards, toward us. You know, as a nation, there isn't a nation on the face of the earth that should be able to spend more time thanking God for the kindness that he has shown us as a nation and the mercy he has shown us as a people. Unfortunately, less and less of that is done with every passing year. The summary summons, in other words, the repeating again that we need to praise God, and the truth of our Lord endures forever. The summary summon, the last three words, praise the Lord. So the petition for his mercy, kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. All of that is the main section. The summary summon is praise the Lord. Let's look at a couple of more. Since these are very, very short, we can do this uh, very easily. And as I said, because this is the largest section, as you read through the book of Psalms, you're going to see far more uh, hymns of praise than anything else. So we'll, we'll take three short illustrations of hymns of praise. And uh, I think it'll help us see the structure. Another short one, uh, the 150th Psalm. Psalm 150, the last psalm in the book of Psalms. Now let me give you the subdivisions again, since this one is only six verses long. Uh, let's see if mentally, as we look at it, you can see the introduction, the main section, and the summary summons. The 150th Psalm, praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with a stringed instrument and flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with high-sounding cymbals. Let everyone that has breath praise the Lord. 
praise the Lord. Now this one is probably as easy to understand structurally as any psalm in the 150 that are in the book. Uh, as I said, we have an introduction, we have a main section, and we have a summary summons. And I think those three elements are probably self-evident, aren't they? The introductory summons, three words long, praise the Lord. The summary summons at the end of verse 6, three words long, praise the Lord. The main section, everything in between. And so we have a very simple three-word introductory summon, a very simple three-word summary summon, and the bulk of the six verses are all the main section. Praise God in your sanctuary. Something we can only get a tiny peek at by looking at the book of Revelation or by looking at the model that was given, which was an earthly model in the tabernacle. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. We've just uh, put up in space a new, more powerful telescope, and every so often you will find on the internet another photograph that for those of us who sing psalms of praise give us the opportunity to look at now a picture that's clearer, that goes deeper into space, and places us more in awe of God's mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Well, those, those are myriad, both those that are communal and those that He has done for you in your own personal life. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. You know, the classic and great hymn, How Great Thou Art, is one of those that praises God for His greatness. Verses 3, 4, 5 are all about whatever, whatever musical systems you have available to you at your time that are used in worship. Worship Him with all of it. I have a, uh, I have a classic uh, uh, album set. I forget how many, uh, how many LPs are in it, uh, five or six of one of the one of the great renditions of Handel's Messiah and it's just phenomenal to sit and listen to full orchestras and uh, full choruses and absolutely stunning uh, individual voices soprano uh, uh, alto tenor and bass sing praises to God as they were captured by Handel in, in Handel's Messiah but this is uh, this is psalms equivalent this is Psalm's way of saying to you, uh, appreciate God with, with all of the forms that God will allow. And then in the conclusion, the simple statement, praise the Lord. All right, in closing, let's do one more, just slightly, well, I, I shouldn't say just slightly longer. We've, we've, we've taken two really, really simple ones so that we can clearly see the structure. Now let's tackle one that's longer and that will be a little more challenging. We only have to go back for this one, two psalms, uh, to the 148th psalm. This one's 14 verses long. So uh, this one will exercise our mental muscle more than the 117th and the 150th. 14 verses. Let me read all the way through it first. And you can think as we do, okay, there's an introduction, there's a main section, and then there's a summary. The 148th Psalm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts. 
Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heaven of hev heavens of heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He has ever established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heavens, and he has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of all the people of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Now, I said to you earlier, in fact, quite early in the Bible study, that usually the introductory piece is very short, and usually the concluding piece is very short. But I also, at that time, uh, gave you a heads up that there are some that don't follow the pattern. And this is one of them. So, what is the introduction? In this particular case, unlike the previous psalm that we just looked at, the 150th, where the introduction was three words long, this one is four verses long. Now you can see that it starts with the same three words, praise the Lord, but it then grabs hold of those three words with a tenacious grip and it embellishes. Praise the Lord, yes. Who? Well, praise him from the heavens, praise him in the heights, Praise him, all you angels. Praise him, all you hosts. Praise him, sun and moon and stars and light, heavens of heavens and waters above the heavens. That's the introductory statement. Verses 5 onward are the main section. You see a very a very firm, and we use this one because the, the, of, of the firmness and the clearness of the transition. Uh, in your Bible and my Bible, every line from the start of verse 1 to uh, the start of verse 4 starts with the word praise. Praise, 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 praise before a line even starts with something other than praise. Verses 5 uh, through 14, first half of 14, are then the main section. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. So now we see, why do you praise? Well, all of these praise God because they were created by him, and he has established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which shall not pass away. And so we have what are called all the laws of science. And the laws of science, they're laws of God. They're laws of God that he put in motion so that everything continues on in order and in decency without chaos and confusion. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the depths. You know, from the time of Jacques Cousteau onward, as men have plumbed the depths of the earth, you stand in awe of all the unusual and strange uh, creatures that are so far below the surface of the sea that man would never see them, nor had men ever seen them until men were able to go a mile, uh, two miles below the surface of the sea and see creatures that never rise above that. 
fire, hail, snow, clouds, stormy winds fulfilling his word. We all stand in awe of the weather. This last week, anyone who's turned on uh, their television have seen houses that have crumbled into the sea and uh, cities that uh, all of their trees have been basically stripped of their leaves by two hurricanes that crossed Florida from different directions. Mountains and all hills, fruitful trees, cedars. He goes on to name beasts and cattle and creeping things and, f and flying fowl. Then all of us, kings, people, princes, judges, young men, young women, old men, children. All of us have the ability through what we see around us, what we've experienced in our own lives, to praise God. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heavens, and he has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. An opportunity again, as I mentioned uh, so far, if there are a people who should be able to praise him as saints, uh, people of the modern day Israel, uh, people that he has always said are near to him. And when we look at the profoundness of our blessings, those blessings have not been something we have earned. They have been gifted to us by a most generous and gracious God. The summary summon, the last three words. Praise the Lord. Well, brethren, as we read the Psalms, uh, this is not by any means a, a, a complete analysis of all of the structural points in Psalms, but these are structural elements that we can look at repeatedly over and over and over again. As I mentioned to begin with, uh, uh, scholars have identified 50 Psalms of lament. So out of the 150 Psalms, a third of them fall in that category. Probably something near to that would also apply to hymns of praise and probably even more. And then in between, Psalms of thanksgiving. If we can see these and understand these structural components, I think they should help all of us be able to appreciate our reading, our study, and our understanding of the book of Psalms.